You're watching Public Comment, Sean O'Connor's video diary vlog focusing on politics, culture, and self. May 31st, 2019. For the first time in, I actually don't know how many years, I think possibly half a decade, I'm taking a look at Ayn Rand's diaries. So it's actually referred to as journals. I apologize, the wording is upside down and backwards there. You might be wondering now, why am I doing this? And so my answer to you is that because my artistic interests have developed into this idea of keeping a video diary and being the fact that I can at least appreciate Ayn Rand's epistemological clarifications, if you will, with respect to Aristotle's laws of identity and non-contradiction you know, in the realm of uh, how do we think logically and determine truth. And because I do enjoy the fact that Ayn Rand values objectivity, she calls her philosophy objectivism, it did seem to me, at least with respect to the issue of thinking out loud and putting one's thoughts down, that there would be some common ground and perhaps some insight that uh, could be found from Ayn Rand, even though it is the case that ethically and politically, I believe that Ayn Rand and I are, well, I don't believe, it is a fact, Ayn Rand and I, I are extremely different when it comes to ethics and politics. Ayn Rand refers to herself as an egoist and has this belief in putting self before all others. I don't see it quite that way. First of all, as opposed to egoism, I just like the word compassion. Call it compassionism if you really want to. It's, compassion is a very interesting and useful word. My understanding of compassion is it's not, it's not like you have to choose between, you know, for Ayn Rand, it was either I'm an egoist or I'm an altruist. Either you or you offer yourself or you're self-sacrificial. I just don't look at compassion, being compassionate, ethical person that way. I believe that if you are compassionate, you of course care about yourself, but it's also not self-sacrificial to spend time caring about other people as well. That's just general compassion. Ironically, I actually think it is in one's self-interest to care about helping others. So maybe I'm a compassionate egoist. Maybe that's the right term for me. Um, I say it is in one's self-interest to help others, lest the society one lives in should crumble into a rather miserable ethos. One thing I like about what Ayn Rand writes in the December of 1935 in this diary here. She's roughly 31 years old, just two years younger than I am now. She goes about identifying her purposes for what would become her great novel, The Fountainhead. This leads me to wonder if I'm doing a good enough job defining my own purposes here. So to review and perhaps clarify if I haven't done a good enough job already. All right. First and foremost for me, why I'm doing what I'm doing with this video diary is because I am just so utterly in love with the experience of thought. It's like one can grasp any aspect of the universe that one wants to touch and make sense of it or integrate it with some other aspect. Thus, keeping records of thoughts for me helps me pay homage to my love for them. Also, I believe that keeping records of thoughts is akin to tracing pieces of a soul, akin to aiding in the effort of expanding awareness of one another beyond the conventional depths. And I will definitely talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. But I will say that one reason I love YouTube so much, say more than Twitter, is that on YouTube, someone can post a vlog 
that's really as long as they feel like. And you can just gaze into that person's eyes and you can see the expressions on their face and the full mood and all of the implications behind the words that they're saying. And I, I believe that this is a more intimate, more powerful bearing of one's soul to another. I believe so that this uh, vlogging, this video diary vlogging thing to me is uh, a most powerful means than in doing that. Uh, very, very little I would say is more precious to me than this. And so there's also my love for preserving time. And it's almost like time traveling in a way. One reason why I'm actually willing to share with you some of my old videos of myself, despite feeling actually severely depressed rewatching them, they bring up these awful memories and feelings, a lot of shame, humiliation, and wishing that I wasn't who I was. And I mean, it's, it even scares me to see the younger version of myself because my mind was so in possession of so many contradictions. However, it's still life preserved, kept tangible. Again, time travel, as I was saying. Anyway, I don't want to get too caught up with my refrain of purpose, though in the context of pointing out what I read from Ayn Rand, it did seem to me appropriate here. Whenever I think about Ayn Rand, I also think of my grandfather. This is my grandfather, Jerry Finn, and this is my grandmother, Norma Finn. Two people I love very much. Anyway. So when I was roughly 13, my grandfather, he, I had told him that I was I'm trying to like hold this the right way, make this more interesting and I don't want to glare. I had told him that I was an atheist and he said that I should read The Fountainhead written by Ayn Rand and he talked about how Ayn Rand was this extremely interesting uh, atheistic philosopher. He used to say, in fact, that she was his favorite philosopher. I've been waiting for the right time to talk to you about my thoughts about Ayn Rand, because she's a woman who changed my world so fundamentally and so powerfully that I suspect the impact is going to last for the rest of my life. Obviously, I can't tell you everything here in a single video diary entry because all that I have to say about Ayn Rand is extraordinarily complex and long-winded. Uh, she's also a complex philosopher in general because she's got epistemological ideas to me that are just so different than her political ones. I view her at times like two different people maybe even three different people, because you've got her logical Ayn Rand, then you've got political Ayn Rand, then you've got artistic Ayn Rand. She would say it's this integration of a whole, and obviously it is a whole Ayn Rand, but in these realms, she's different, has sort of different, um, I would say, focuses and uh, Well, I would say, you know, her ideas of logic make sense, and then she just starts contradicting herself as she sort of builds up her hierarchically developed sense of philosophy. The first time I read Ayn Rand, I actually don't remember so much about it. I was 23, living in Chesterfield, New Jersey. You can find a video of sort of what I was like at that time. I'm making it available. It scares the hell out of me. It doesn't make me feel great in certain respects, but like I said, it's who I was, and I'm proud that I'm not that way now. And to have grown out of that makes me feel actually quite great. 
Anyway, I just didn't really take much away from reading Ayn Rand that first time around. The theme of the book, one of them, right, is individuality and the importance of not shying away from one's individuality, not being uh, afraid to be different and challenge conventions of the masses, so to speak. That was just nothing new to me. So on a first reading of The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand, as far as I could understand, she was just preaching to the choir. Now, the second time I read Ayn Rand, when I lived in West Windsor, that was quite a different thing. I was 25. I had just thrown out my second novel. I had quit my brief vlogging phase on Ustream and YouTube. I was in the midst of reading Ulysses by James Joyce, which was just too hard for me to read at the time, too, too hard to appreciate. I mean, the problem I had with Joyce was that I would just spend hour upon hour of looking up words because he went out of his way to use words that were obscure and archaic. In hindsight, I actually appreciate the artistic quality of that effort, and maybe I'd enjoy reading him more today at some point, uh, but at that point in time, it just wasn't resonating with me. I don't know what it was I felt I needed to read or be exposed to intellectually exactly, but Joyce just wasn't offering that to me, and I was in a tremendous rut. Now, I don't know how many times I've told the story and where I've told it anymore, uh, but the way it goes, you know, I confided in my wife about all this being in a rut, and, well, my wife has always known me so well, and knowing that I valued individualism and having seen the book about head laying around, reading the back of it, at one point she said I'd probably enjoy and get some refreshment and inspiration by rereading The Fountainhead. And I thought, why not? And interestingly, you know, in doing so, I had seen individualism in a new light. Suddenly it was more obvious than just self-esteem, but rather uh, this time it was like a philosophical idea with depth to it, with intellectually constructed thoughts supporting it. And so it was this individualism idea versus what she would call collectivism. I mean, I just hadn't thought of it in the context of a debate before. To me, again, individualism was just a given. So I didn't, there was no need to really think of it intellectually. It was just too obvious. But that no longer being the case, and I'm not exactly sure what enabled me to think essentially more intellectually here and understand her words better. But there I am having failed to sell a book and just feeling like another failure and all of a sudden I'm understanding her, her book is hitting, her book is hitting me deeper. And I start to think, you know, a lot of things are really going on at this time. When I turn 25 and while I'm reading The Fountainhead, so many things are happening at this time. It's just one of the most interesting time periods in my life because that was when I actually started to believe in the existence of knowledge, a loaded topic I can get into to at another time. But I was also thinking about among the uh, plethora of things I was contemplating while reading this novel was that Ayn Rand made a lot of money writing The Fountainhead. It was a bestseller. So I'm thinking, I better delve into this lady and figure out what her secret is. How is it that she can write philosophy and make so much money? And so I'm doing that. And as I'm also delving into the various things that she writes and things other people write about her, I'm examining this idea of money. Money is a concept of private property and something that you work for 
and something that, you know, when you're taxed, it's literally taken from you. Money that you own, that you no longer own, that you owe to the government. By consequence of what? Fines, force. So I'm thinking, you know, don't you have a right to that money? Or to what degree do you not have a right to that money? You know, it lacked at the time a real nuanced way to ultimately conceptualize and think about taxation. But I was thinking about rights, and I was thinking about function of government. And I was also thinking about, again, some of Ayn Rand's more esoteric writings about knowledge and logic concepts. And so you see, I'm developing this fundamental philosophical consciousness beyond the way that I'd ever done so before. That summer in particular, I spent every second that I wasn't working at the grocery store studying every bit of Ayn Rand writing that I could get my hands on. I borrowed someone's copy of Atlas Shrugged and I took that novel on hardcore, took notes, I did little writing responses to all of the ideas and things and kept track of the characters. And I just want to share with you very briefly part of that novel that resonates with me still today because it, it's just so central to my thinking. So she offers the maxim here, existence exists. Something exists which one perceives and one exists possessing consciousness. Consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. And she adds, A is A. A thing is itself. The law of identity. A leaf cannot be a stone at the same time. And Ayn Rand defines reason. She says reason is the faculty that perceives identifies and integrates the material provided by one's senses. And she defines logic. She defines logic as the art of non-contradictory identification, adding that a contradiction cannot exist. Uh, this is all in page 929, 933, at least of this version of the book. So say what one will about where Ayn Rand deviates from all that, but the importance of embracing this fundamental epistemological principle, in my view, seems like something that uh, just can't ever be overstated. I mean, it's the basis of science, journalism, truth, constructive thought. To that end, again, I believe it's all quite ironic. Ayn Rand makes a... Uh, it's ironic. What did I write there? I don't know. Um, but she makes this uh, tremendous contribution to philosophical thought. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Um, but um, yet she doesn't apply them properly, right? Because she's got this notion of non-contradiction. And she calls herself an objectivist, but she comes across to me more like an idealist. You know, she has these ideologies in her head in their pure forms. She, she comes across more like Plato. Uh, and she only seems to see ideologies in their pure forms and therefore has this, in, in conjunction with this, has this view of humanity as just being naturally prone to extreme degrees of rationality. And thus, so for example, take a libertarian political system where people are given immense freedom. In Ayn Rand's mind, they're supposed to just be rational because they're left alone, and they will be rational and decent. And if not, there's a means to not have to deal with them. But she just, again, because she, she's an idealist, the way I view her, as opposed to an objectivist, she overlooks the fact that with freedom comes abuse of freedom, slavery, exploitation, these kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot to say about Ayn Rand in the future, and I will certainly bring her up, but I want to keep it just to where it's appropriate, to where my thoughts are at a particular given time, as opposed to just writing like a treatise about her. Moving on to another topic then. Two friends of mine and I yesterday debated some of the candidates in the Democratic presidential primary election. We spoke specifically about Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren. 
Now, one friend of mine, he dislikes Kamala Harris for changing her views on prostitution. Because at one point, apparently, he says Kamala Harris supports legalizing prostitution, and then she flakes out. Conveniently, there's actually a New York Times article that just came out today reporting that uh, she was on the record as decriminalizing prostitution. There's a cited and hyperlinked Facebook interview from The Root uh, in this article. She also said in a CNN town hall event on April 23rd that she is in favor of decriminalizing prostitution. Now, there's a Reason Magazine article about this supposed flip-flopping. I'm not sure exactly. This is a weird, essentially like putting words in her mouth, what this article does. And that is perhaps how the rumor that she has flip-flopped is uh, invented. Um, obviously, I will make sure that you're linked to that article. But um, literally, <laughs> misrepresenting Kamala, Senator Kamala Harris and putting words in her mouth the writer for a reason, Elizabeth Nolan Brown, writes, quote, Harris still thinks paying for sex should be a crime. She just wants to classify all female sex workers as victims so as to avoid arresting them. Rather disturbingly, in my opinion, Brown completely ignores Senator Harris's point that pimps trafficking minors should be prosecuted. No mention of this. Senator Harris actually never said um, paying for sex should be a crime. So I'm just not even sure why Brown says this. Harris says, literally, quote, we should not be criminalizing women who are engaged in consensual opportunities for employment, close quote. So again, just not sure where this is all. There's just fabrications here. My other friend made a comment saying that Kamala Harris flip-flopped on health care. I'm not sure where he got this information from, but it's, as I understand it, just not accurate. These conservative and libertarian websites, they really are going after Kamala Harris and trying to misquote her in a lot of ways. So, for example, with this health insurance thing, the conservative and libertarian sites are widely reporting Kamala Harris as saying that she wants to eliminate private health insurance plans and then that she then changed her mind on that. That's just not exactly what she said, though. What she did do is address complaints that exist about how private insurance plans tend to do harm to the people covered in these plans. So what she does say is, quote, let's eliminate all that, close quote, in reference to those problems. But she never says, let's get rid of private health insurance. So I just find it haunting the way that uh, people put words in one another's mouths sometimes. And this is one more reason why I feel so passionate about keeping this video diary. It seems as if many in the media get away with not really listening and that some people therefore believe these misinterpretations and that's how you get you know, misinformation. This first friend I was telling you about he also expressed to me his distaste for Senator Elizabeth Warren, Massachusetts. He didn't like specifically how she was so adamant about the need to impeach President Trump. He emphasized that a year ago, when the two of us were passionately pro-impeachment, that Senator Warren was not. He thinks she's merely an opportunist to now running for president, thinking she can score political points, says she wants to see the president impeached. My friend contrasted her to Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, saying Pelosi is more measured. I'm going to disagree, though, uh, though it may be a fair point that maybe Elizabeth Warren, one might argue she's an opportunist, though another person might argue she really just wanted to wait for the Mueller report and hear what it had to say before she wanted to jump to too many conclusions. So not sure I can agree with my friend on that point or agree with him really in his assessment of Nancy Pelosi. I think maybe she is trying to appear measured by not going right for impeachment, but I, to me, she actually just comes across as tepid 
and a slave to re-election. By the way, speaking of Senator Warren, news broke around 10 o'clock this morning, reported in the New York Times and The Hill. Uh, Senator Warren is calling for legislation that would make it clear a president can be indicted, which to me makes sense. It's impressive. I'm glad she's doing this. She's saying what needs to be said with respect to where policy must go. Uh, but I did want to go back to impeachment, but I just wanted to put that out there too. Uh, Elizabeth Warren looking very good right now in, in my book. But so with my friend's views of uh, Pelosi's cautiousness, uh, cautiousness as politically smart by leaving the impeachment option open without committing to it, you know, well, she's rallying support without alienating independents and moderate on certain Democrats who will be turned off by Russian impeachment. Yeah, but I just, um, to refer to what Elizabeth Warren has been saying, she's been saying this over and over, that some things just matter more than politics. And I agree. If rushed impeachment hurts Democrats, that could lead to the Republicans taking back power. That's what my friend's so afraid of. And he's afraid that then Obamacare would be abolished and other health care protections. So I get why he's worried about policy consequences of the left doing things that just don't resonate with enough people. But I think to base every policy decision on these uh, gauges of public support or the public giving up support, I just think that at some point that becomes um, dismissing your conscience. And I'm not so sure we'd live in a safe world or that healthcare would be in such a great place in that kind of world. And that's all I have to say for today. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye.